Our gospel today comes from Matthew 18, verses 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle an account with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and his children and all his possessions and a payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that slain slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him by the throat. He said, pay what you owe. And then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he could pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported back to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I have had mercy on you? And in his anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if, do, if you do not forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. The Gospel of the Lord. Be to God. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, from Jesus, our Savior, and from the Holy Spirit who sustains us all. Amen. So I think forgiveness is incredibly complicated. I think it is a long process that takes a long time to do sometimes. And sometimes, like the kids said, sometimes it's easy. There are things that are easier to forgive than others. But I know in my life that it has been a journey of me learning what forgiveness looks like. In our gospel reading for today, Jesus instructs the people to forgive 70 time, 77 times. Some translations say that it's 70 times 7. And now, I think that's in the 400s if I'm doing my math correctly, but that is a ton of forgiveness. I think Peter, when he's first asking this question, he's already trying to think quite expansively. He's saying that we're called to forgive seven times. But, but Jesus goes beyond that, telling us to forgive continuously, to forgive 70 times seven times. It's an extravagant amount. And then Jesus goes on to share a parable about forgiveness. I think this parable is meant to show us some of the absurdity about what forgiveness looks like and what it, what, what absurd, how absurd it is when we don't sometimes forgive others, especially when we have been forgiven so abundantly. I just want to acknowledge that the language in this text is really problematic. The language of slavery in a, is a horrible system, um, and that is a, a huge sermon, a multi-series sermon on itself, but I just wanted to acknowledge that for a minute. Um, but that's not going to be the focus for today's message. In this parable, this slave owes so much money to his king. He shows up, and he didn't have it. The, what he owed was, were, was uh, forgiven debt about 150,000 years of wages. Now, none of us could work that off. That is an extreme amount of time. So he shows up. He doesn't have the money. I don't, I don't think he ever could have that money. And the king says that he is going to be sold with his family to try and pay back that debt. But the king, but eventually this man falls on his face. He begs for forgiveness, and the king forgives his entire debt. And regardless of what he's, what he's promised, um, again, there's no way that he could have paid that debt. It was unpayable. But the king responds so generously, forgiving him anyway. One might expect this person to go and forgive others, because that was an abundant amount of forgiveness. But that's not what happens in this parable. 
the same man was owed some money from another, a far less amount. It was around 100 days worth of wages. Now, 100 days versus 150,000 years. That is a small debt in comparison. And he also similarly asks to be forgiven. He gets down on his knees and he begs for forgiveness. But this man who has just been forgiven doesn't forgive him. Instead, he throws him into prison until he can repay that debt. Now, the text says that all who saw it were greatly distressed because they saw the injustice in this. They saw that when we are forgiven, we should try and forgive others. They saw how abundantly the king had forgiven the man. And they saw that this mercy didn't transform him, but instead furthered his own vengeance. The king eventually brings this man back, and he sends him to be tortured until he can repay all of his debt. Now, I read a little bit into the law, and basically you couldn't torture somebody for a, a payment of debt. All you could do was send them to prison. So this king is acting more out of vengeance because he sees some form of wrong here but he's not acting out of generosity or out of forgiveness. He's becoming very tyrant-like. This parable and every character in it demonstrate some of the absurdity and the, and the complicatedness of forgiveness, how it may be hard for us, how it may be hard for others, but it ultimately implies that when we have been forgiven a great deal, so should we forgive those around us. And unlike this king and unlike the slave, God continues to show us forgiveness day in and day out. I know in my life, forgiveness has been more of a journey like the king and like the slaves. It is a hard thing for me to do sometimes. And it's a journey that I am constantly on. Now, I know that we are called to forgiveness. I know that it is important. But I still have a ton of questions around it. Because forgiveness is hard, but we also need it deeply. I still have questions like, are we called to forgive in situations of abuse or extortion or personal violence done to us or towards those that we love? I still struggle with that. And, and why are, is it that some seem to have to forgive so much more than others? Why is it that there is so much injustice in our world that requires some to forget more than others around us? And what about people who continue to do the things that we've already forgiven them for? How do we keep showing them mercy time in and time out? What do we do in situations like this? I think it's hard and it's complicated, but I'm also confident in the fact that we are taught and encouraged to forgive. Forgiveness is a crucial component of living this life because we as humans are messy and complicated. We mess up, we do the wrong thing, we hurt people around us. And if we don't forgive, and if we aren't forgiven, we will just live with guilt and burdens constantly. People are going to disappoint us, make us mad, and upset us. But forgiveness enables us to heal within ourselves, to heal from those things that have caused us pain. Last week, we talked about the difference between reconciliation and forgiveness a little bit. We talked more about reconciliation, and I think it's an important distinction because reconciliation requires two parties coming to the table, airing their grievances, hearing one another. They may not change immediately, but they eventually process the hurt that has happened there. Forgiveness can exist without any of the people that have been wronged, just you, you and yourself. Because forgiveness comes from us, and it often enables us to heal our own selves. But sometimes we should reconcile, and we need to. But sometimes there are situations where we need to let people go in our lives, and we just have to learn how to forgive them along the way. And so I just want to say, again, those are very two different things. Because forgiveness just needs us. It's about the state of our own hearts. It's about if we are holding on to our own pain and our own hurt, and holding it so tightly that it continues to hurt ourselves. And I think it also means that we have to take it to God, take our burdens here to God. And again, forgiveness does not necessarily require a continued friendship or relationship or even conversation. More often than not, the person who has been forgiven around us may not even know that we've forgiven them. Um... Often without forgiveness, there is more anger and more violence in our world. I was reminded this week, as it was the anniversary of 9-11, how much hatred and violence really harms and hinders our society. 
the 9-11 happened because people were angry at the United States. They hated the United States. And in, in, in return, we lashed out in anger and in frustration. Now, I'm not going to say whether that was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, but it certainly was not a part of forgiveness. And I think that it, that fueled more and more death. It fueled more and more harm. It's especially hard to forgive in light of such atrocities. But if we don't allow for healing in ourselves and as, in our, as a society, then that harm just gets continued and it gets furthered. And hatred will continue to corrupt us, corrupt those around us as well. Forgiveness like this is not easy because it's in the face of a lot of death and violence, but it's important to try and to strive for it. In college, I started to realize that I had a lot of hurts and a lot of pain from the church that I grew up in. They did not ordain women, and I had felt called to ministry from an early age. They didn't allow for same-sex relationships, and they taught against them, and I'm gay. <laughs> um, I had a lot of hurt and a lot of burdens on my shoulders. And I was very angry at many of the people. I was very angry at the institution of the church. And it, it really weighed on me. It made it hard for me to go into churches on my own. It made it hard for me to be in relationships with people that I really cared about. I would be in conversations with my mom and just get so mad at little things that she said because I was carrying so much around that I hadn't learned to let go of yet. And so I, my anger just dwelled and dwelled within me. And eventually I started to realize that my anger and my frustration was limiting me from living life. It was limiting me from living into the freedom that Christ has offered us. And it was limiting me as I was trying to love people it was limiting me from loving people who are also beloved children of God. I felt that because I didn't feel fully loved, that they shouldn't either. But that's not true. We all need to feel fully loved. And so, unbeknownst to me, I started working on this. I started a process of forgiveness without even fully acknowledging it at first. Slowly, I would um, realize that my angers were going away, that my frustration was going away. I think God was doing a big work in my heart and in my life. And then there was another part that I started to work on that I was conscious of. I started to recognize that I needed to pray for the people that I felt had hurt me. I wanted to pray, and I needed to pray that, there, that they would feel God's love as radically as I did. I started to have conversations with those around me who had had similar hurts from churches they grew up in, and I was able to process my pain with them. And being able to talk about it really helped me heal. And for a long time, I would continue to be in relationship with a lot of these people. I would go to home for Christmas, and I would go to church. And I would sit in the back row getting mad at everything that the pastor said. I would get mad at everything that happened in worship because I was carrying a big burden. But eventually, I started to realize that that place wasn't somewhere that I could continue to show up in because it just kept me angry. And so I started to put up some boundaries. I started to say, I'm not going to go to that church when I'm home for Christmas. Instead, I'm going to go to this one. And being able to separate myself and create distance from that community was something that I really needed for a time, something I still need. I, I don't really go back there anymore. Not that I don't want the best for them, but it's just not a place that I can be a part of at this time. And there were others that I also needed to reconcile with. There were people that were dear, dear friends of mine in that place that I wanted to be in relationship with. They were people that I um, would you know, play with when I was growing up. They were people that I would talk to all of high school, my best friends. And so there were some that I chose to try and reconcile with. And I, I entered into conversation with them about the wrong that I had felt from that community. And being able to reconcile was an important step. But that wasn't needed with everybody in that community. I am still on this process. It is something that I still strive to forgive daily sometimes because things come up with forgiveness. There are th little things that will come up in daily conversations that remind us of our hurt and that remind us of our pain. But I have also begun to start discovering some peace there because God has been working in my heart, and God has been leading me to forgive those in that community. I pray that God continues because it's not all done yet. Forgiveness is a journey. 
Sometimes it's one that lasts a lifetime. It is such a process. Rather than being a one-time event of saying, I forgive you, most of the time it's a lifetime process. It happens again and again because the things that harm us don't just go away immediately when we've said, they're forgiven now. They come up again. Maybe they come up in the news or conversations or just little things that trigger us and remind us again of our hurts. Forgiveness is a process that sometimes takes a lifetime. In the book, The Kite Runner, which happens to be one of my favorite books, it's a beautiful story about a boy who's born in Afghanistan, and it's a beautiful story of a journey of forgiveness and through a lifetime based in abandonment, hurt, and betrayal. And the main character in the story describes forgiveness this way. He says, I wondered if that was how forgiveness budded, not with the fanfare of epiphany, but with the pain of gathering its things, packing up and slipping away unannounced in the middle of the night, but with the pain of gathering its things, packing up and slipping away unannounced in the middle of the night. Sometimes we forgive people without even really knowing that we've forgiven them. Sometimes we work through the process in the, in the night and it just goes away and drifts away and we're able to live into fuller freedom. Now, I don't know what your stories of hurt are. I don't know the things that you need to forgive in your life, the burdens that you're carrying. And I'm not going to tell you to forgive because I don't think that forgiveness can be prescribed. I think that forgiveness has to become from within each and every one of us when the Spirit prompts us and tells us that we are ready to do so. And sometimes it's not the time yet. Sometimes we need to hold on to our anger longer. Sometimes that's a part of the process too. And maybe there will be things that, you know, you have to let ling linger in and that God will lead you when the, pa when the time is right to begin forgiving. There are certainly things in my life that I haven't fully forgiven yet. And there's things that I'm not ready to forgive. You know, it's a, it's a process. I hope that God continues, though, to guide me and to guide each and every one of us as we continue to realize the ways that we need to forgive others around us. Because forgiveness helps us breathe easier. It lifts our burdens from us. It doesn't matter about the other person, but it does a ton for ourselves. What I am absolutely confident on, even in the complicatedness of forgiveness, is that our God continues and continues to forgive abundantly. Not like the king or the slave in this parable. Our God doesn't return our evils with a tyrant in, in putting us in torture. Our God continues to love us abundantly, despite the things that we continue to mess up of, and even because of them. God continues to forgive in the midst of all of our messes, all the things that we do wrong, all the ways in which we turn away from God, we turn away our, from our neighbors, and we turn away from ourselves. God continues to love us and show us grace even when we don't deserve it. One of my favorite things that Jesus says, um, something that I deeply, deeply admire, is when Jesus is on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. He's saying this to the very people who are crucifying him, showing us time and time again that God's forgiveness knows no bounds. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Jesus continues to show them grace and mercy, even when we are uncertain, and even when we are in the midst of our own brokenness. Jesus loves us abundantly. Each Sunday when we come to this place at the beginning of the service, we are reminded of the Lord's abundant forgiveness. When we confess corporately, and when we hear the good news that Christ has forgiven us all, it's the best news that we get to hear every week because it allows us to live in such freedom and in newness of life. So I'm going to end with saying these words. With joy, I proclaim to you that almighty God, rich in mercy, abundant in love, forgives you of all your sin and grants you newness of life in Christ Jesus. Amen.